Currently, there are approximately 71 principals and assistant principals within the school system. There are approximately 62 choirs and nine, nine non choirs. Recently, Titus Hopper, a principal fellow from the Cleveland County School System who served as an AP in the Burns School District, applied for a position who was not selected because he was either not qualified, not selectable, or not the best fit. These are concerns we have with the continued experience of minorities with qualifications not being selected for the court. Another concern of the NAACP and the current and the system of Cleveland County is the policy to address the 1.0 GPA for our student athletes that continue to play sports on a weekly basis. These students fill our stadiums and gymnasiums, but at the conclusion of their high school experience, these student athletes cannot attend Division I schools. At, that, at this point in their life, they are faced with limited alternatives to continue their education and qualification for scholarship. Finally, we believe that this group or the number of minority students that attend Turning Point Academy and those that are charged in the criminal system is currently approximately a three to one ratio, while the ratio of minority students in the county is less than 30%. We the NAACP are concerned, and concerned citizens of the county are concerned about these issues. And what we come today to recommend uh, to the board is that the diversity team uh, that was established a few years ago in some form continue to exist to make recommendations to the superintendent of the school as well as the school board to close these gaps in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the consideration of the minutes from June 9th, 9th, 2014, business and work session. What's the pleasure of the board? Thank you, Mr. We approve the minutes for the June 9th, 2014, business and work session. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. On to innovative leadership, we're pleased to have with us tonight, <clears throat> as always, the uh, president of the North Carolina School Board Association and uh, state representative on the state school board. So we're going to turn it over to take ladies first for uh, Ms. Miller to talk to us about NCSBA and then Richard Hooker to talk to us about the state school board. Sure. Um, our last board meeting for North Carolina School Board Association was June 20th, and um, fairly typical board meeting. And uh, just briefly, I'll let you know that we did receive a legislative update at that meeting, but since that time, a lot of things have changed, and some haven't. Um, we're still waiting on the, the budget to be approved and agreed upon by um, the House and the Senate, although from what I've heard is that Quite honestly, they may just leave and go home without approving it because there is a budget already in place. And so if they do that, then, you know, no teacher raises, um, no, I mean, everything would just be the same as last year. But that's kind of the sort of inside scoop that I've been given. But who knows, it, it could change their meeting tonight, I believe. So, um, and you all received legislative updates weekly from the association, so I won't go into to any of those. Um, we did, uh, Eddie Spees, the attorney, one of the attorneys that is representing all of the school boards in North Carolina uh, in the litigation, um, uh, uh, questioning the, or challenging the constitutionality of the Opportunity Scholarship. Eddie was there and gave us a report. Of course, part of the report that he gave us was um, that there was to be a meeting this past Friday to determine whether or not the Speaker of the House and the President Pro Tem would be allowed to, to intervene. But that meeting, I was told today, did not happen on Friday. And you've probably heard in the news that um, the group that um, it will be issuing the money, the funds, uh, the scholarships to those families that applied for the funding, um, that they have been told that they can go ahead and fast track that money. So, 
what we're thinking is that um, the money will be issued prior to the August 13th day, which is when the summary judgment hearing is to take place. So the money will go to these families before the judge actually has a chance to rule on it. And so if he decides that um, that it is unconstitutional or decides to put a stay on it, the money's already out there to the family. So things are, are moving very quickly with that. Uh, June Atkinson was also there. She, um, she again, all of this was happening in part of to some of the legislation that's already occurred, but she talked to us mostly about the budget, about her, her thoughts on, on the budget at that time, and also on Common Core. Um, and of course, we know what the ruling has been on Common Core, and so that really is a moot point now. She continues to be extremely frustrated with, um, with our legislators and, and but she was, it was a good visit with her. We also heard um, from two outside groups. One, um, Boy Scouts of America have a, a, a quite an interesting after school program that they're willing to partner with school systems to offer this at no cost to the school systems. And um, we have some information. I think Richard actually pulled some of that together and passed on to, to the appropriate ones here just in case we might get there. They're piloting a program is in one of the eastern counties um, that, that they're piloting this program it, yeah, to, to work with, with the school system there. I mean, it sounded sounded really good. We also heard from um, a company that is actually, it's called Open Source Social Media, and they, they will monitor social media in, in our area to, um, to see if there's any, I guess, you know, we, you hear about chatter that's going on out there, and so they will actually monitor the chatter that's going on in your community to see if there might be some potential sources of danger um, to the students, to the school system. And again, we've got some information on that. I think that is going to be a company that the association will partner with if, if it's something that we would be interested in. Um, and it's another resource for um, helping to improve the school safety then um, we would go through the association for that. Um, her reports from the Goals and Directions Committee, um, and the most significant uh, thing that came out of that committee is are trying to come up with ways that the association can partner with the National School Board Association to, um, to help promote public education and to help us continue to, to keep the, the good news out there and, and uh, to bring out the positives. Also, the conference planning committee met and reported the most significant change for the um, state conference this November um, will be that the delegate assembly that has traditionally been on Tuesday morning will now be Tuesday afternoon. Um, excuse me, it will be Monday afternoon. It's moved from Monday morning to Monday afternoon. All the breakout sessions will be on Tuesday, and the recognitions. Uh, service at, on Tuesday night. They are really working hard to pare that down from like two and a half to three hours down to about an hour or so, which is, that's always been the, the biggest complaint that I think that, that they've received. And so that committee is working hard on that. So um, that's, that's our day long meeting in a very small much. Pleased to, to be there and I continue to be very honored to serve Thank you, Madam President. Uh, it's also an honor to, to serve with uh, uh, my colleague at the State Board uh, at the uh, North Carolina School Board Association, where she serves as president. And I'm honored to serve as one of the uh, uh, members of the Board of Directors. Also, as, the, as a recipient of the Ronald Demon, I also have the honor and privilege to serve as a member, uh, as a advisory ex, ex officio, if you will, with the North Carolina State Board of Education. Uh, and uh, as you see, I've had somewhat, I presented to you this uh, evening a uh, somewhat of a voluminous report. <laughs> uh, the chair has, has advised me to keep it somewhat short and abbreviated. So I will attempt to provide somewhat of an abbreviated overview of some of the activities that took place subsequent to my uh, last report on March the 10th. I presented some of the uh, activities and 
presentations and programs from January through March. Uh, this uh, report reflects activities that occurred from the um, April meeting through July meeting, which uh, the July meeting was a conference call, but April we had the privilege and the opportunity to attend, uh, to go to the, the University of North Carolina at Pembroke to do a three-day three um, review and overview of, a, of the state's strategic uh, plan. And I provided a very abbreviated copy of that in the report. Uh, certainly was much more in-depth, but part of the highlights of that was that uh, the uh, North Carolina School Board um, of State Board of Education uh, vision was to that every student, public student, will graduate ready for post-secondary education and work and preparing for a globally engaged and productive citizen uh, was the vision that was outlined. And of course the mission of the State Board of Education is that it has the constitutional duty to lead and uphold the system of public education in North Carolina. And there were several goals, objectives, and measures that they looked at in terms of measuring how um, advanced North Carolina would move in terms of being a uh, active participant in the 21st century. Again, I won't go into uh, detail, but some of the highlights were that uh, every student in North Carolina students who graduated from high school prepared for work and their education. And they looked at graduation rates, they look at the percentage of students who would be uh, going to post-secondary education. They looked at the five-year plan in terms of the percentages, the goals, and the measurements of where the state plans to be from 2011 through 2017, 2016 through 2017. So there were progressive measurements and goals that were established. Uh, even though we, in, as a state, enjoy the highest uh, graduation rates, uh, but the anticipation and the projection is that North Carolina will continue to improve and enhance, not only reducing the dropout rate, but to increase the graduation rate, coupled with the fact that they want to try to get more students to uh, attend college, as well as uh, uh, take more advanced courses, more CTA courses, and uh, as well as uh, making sure that every student has a personalized educational plan, uh, that every day, every student will have an excellent educator in front of them, and that every school district has up-to-date financial, business, and technology systems to serve as students and parents uh, in, the, uh, in the school community. And finally, that every student is healthy, safe, and responsible. And of course, there were uh, numerous objections that were outlined, and again, because of time, I do not want to take the additional time, because it was, we were there for three days. So it was a very intense, a very comprehensive overview, and a very comprehensive overhaul of the strategic plan for the State Board of Education. And uh, if you have any additional questions that you'd like to address after the meeting, I'd be happy to share some of those. But uh, again, it was a very uh, informative session very uh, enlightening to me to get a better scope and appreciation of the tremendous responsibility that the state has in serving 1.5 million students in the state of North Carolina. In addition to that, uh, as I've outlined uh, in my brief summary, a couple other areas I wanted to cover just briefly was in the area of charter schools. Most of you remember that um, in 2011 I was appointed by Governor Purdue uh, to serve on the Charter School Advisory Committee. Uh, and I was the only school board member on that committee throughout the state. So it was a very tough uh, situation to be in, but I learned a lot, gained a great appreciation uh, for the alternative choices that students have in the state of North Carolina. What I wanted to do is just briefly share some of the current statistics. In 2011, when the uh, uh, I think the statutory requirements had changed to take the cap off of charter schools. At that time, the cap was on charter schools for almost 15 years of 100 charter schools. Currently, and I won't go into details on all the specifics, currently there are approximately 150 charter schools, which means that since 2011, 26, uh, approximately uh, 50 to include 
those that will be coming on board in August of 2014. That will bring a total of 150 uh, charter schools, which is a, approximately a 50% increase since they took off uncap. And it is a projected that in the next couple of years that charter schools will double in uh, North Carolina to approximately 2,000. Correction, 200, 200. Uh, there are approximately 69,000 students who attend charter schools statewide, which represents less than maybe three, two to three percent of the total uh, student population in the state. And um, I did not bring the data in terms of how charter schools are performed with traditional education systems, but when you look at the composite, charter schools do not fare better than public education based on the data. Okay? There are some pockets where there are some excellent charter schools I've had the privilege of reviewing and improving some of the very excellent, innovative charter schools. But when you look across the board, uh, charter schools uh, fare either level or somewhat under what traditional public education has provided our students. So, uh, but again, it does provide choices for students, but it also provides the opportunity and the challenge for us to continue to intensify efforts, to continue to improve uh, focus on continuous improvement to ensure that our system uh, is a school system that is a school of choice for our parents uh, who want to give their students a quality education. In addition to the tra charter school discussion, one of the more com controversial issues at the state level has been the issue of virtual charter schools. And, uh, Needless to say, uh, the initial charter school application, virtual charter school application that came through the Concord community uh, was turned down. There was a very intense study that was done on the virtual charter school. And I shared with the state board some of my concerns and some of my issues as I'm struggling to find my notes. But essentially, um, when you look at and survey virtual charter schools nationally, uh, there's still a lot of concern in terms of how they address uh, students at, that are at risk, how they address various subgroups, how they address disaggregating the data to determine uh, how students uh, who come from various subgroups and who are at risk, how they are performing across the landscape of virtual charter schools. And essentially, the report pretty much concluded uh, that the verdict is still out on, on virtual charter schools. And, uh, but I thought that the study was um, was very uh, comprehensive, but it still leaves a lot of question marks in terms of the viability of virtual charter schools in the state of North Carolina. With that being said, however, in the, uh, the uh, number of uh, charter schools that are currently being reviewed, and they will be presented at the state school board meeting uh, next week or the first week in August, there is, however, one virtual charter school that's as part of the selection process that will be uh, reviewed, uh, which will be interesting to see how that turns out. But, uh, but uh, for one did finally get to uh, the table in terms of uh, uh, being reviewed by the Charter School Advisory Committee and their recommendation would then become for uh, the State Board of Education. So it puts me on a different uh, plateau, if you will, where I was part of the process of recommending charter schools to the State Board of Education, they are sitting at the table where those state, the State Board of Education have to approve or disapprove those charter schools that are coming before the Board of Education. So those are just some of the highlights that relate to charter schools. Uh, and I talked a little bit about the strategic plan. The other piece of information that I want to share, and again, uh, when you talk about the State Board of Education, you talk about a very broad, gigantic machinery with many components and many layers. And part of your package I highlighted uh, was a, a report that shows some of the departments and the representatives of those departments that, uh, that represent uh, those supporting agencies to assist school districts uh, in the uh, education community throughout North Carolina. Let me conclude by uh, just highlighting a little bit on another important study that was presented at the last uh, state board of meeting, and that was uh, the preliminary finding for the 2014 North Carolina Teacher Working Conditions Survey. 
And of course, as you know, we just completed uh, our own district-wide survey. And I think the survey uh, that we have pretty much mirrored what the state is. And uh, the report shows that over 100,000 teachers and principals participated in the survey. And uh, the survey from when it originated in 2002 has remained somewhat level and stable over the years, except that I wanted to highlight a couple of preliminary findings that I thought would be interesting. Uh, for one, uh, there was some high, basically there was very high uh, reporting of, of in the findings to reflect uh, teacher satisfaction with the conditions in the school systems. For an example, more than 9 out of 10 educators, or 93%, reported that their faculty work in a school environment was safe, and that's positive. Uh, nearly 94% of respondents indicated that teachers are held to a high professional standards for delivering instructions, and that's one of the higher ones. And also over 94% of educators agree that the school leadership facilities use the data to improve student, student learning. Let me repeat that. 94% of educators agree that school leadership facilitates using data to improve student learning. And that, of course, is one of the, you know, the uh, uh, standards that we utilize in terms of making decisions in terms of student learning is we view the data, we uh, analyze the data, uh, and uh, uh, we certainly uh, continue to uh, use that as a model to help enhance our student learning. Some of the declines that were reported uh, was that um, uh, there was a reduction in the percentage, even though it was 74% of teachers have su sufficient as access to appropriate instructional material. Uh, and that represents about a 5% drop from the previous year. Uh, the percentage of educators uh, receiving uh, the number of hours of professional de development declined, which suggests that they were not receiving the amount of professional development that they felt that they deserved. Uh, and obviously, uh, that's continued to be a challenge in our school system. Uh, I thought one of the things that is really not a surprise, and that was that, uh, that uh, North Carolina Education reported uh, some concerns related to the time and the use of time to, to educate the students so they uh, felt that they needed more time, surprisingly. They needed more time to, to properly educate um, the, the students. And finally, more North Carolina educators report immediate plans to leave education. That increased significantly. So it's, which is not a surprise that uh, across the landscape of North Carolina, you'll find more educators that are disenchanted with some of the things based on some of the changes legislated you know, um, uh, changes that has caused and um, motivated more teachers than ever before to leave the uh, educational system, which is uh, uh, a little discerning, but, uh, but nonetheless, um, those are just some of the indicators. So uh, again, this was a very in-depth study. Uh, you do have the report a little bit more depth, some of the data, some of the graphs and everything. I just highlighted a few areas. Uh, for your benefit, just to share uh, how comprehensive and how uh, uh, involved uh, you know some of these studies are, but it does reveal overall, however, uh, conditions are good for instruction, instructional learning throughout the landscape of the world. So that's a positive step. And, uh, and again, as I mentioned, over 100,000 teachers participate in the response. And finally. Functions and oversight responsibilities, again, as I mentioned, the you know, state board has a very uh, comprehensive machinery. I wanted to just to give appreciation of the different departments and uh, responsibilities of those <coughs> that make up those. And finally, I said I was going to do it, but I did also do the report of uh, the State Board of Education legislative agenda. And I think it would be important to note that some of their legislative agenda do align with our agenda with the Northwest School Board Association such as increased teacher pay, uh, for an example, uh, uh, reinstating the master's and doctoral pay. Uh, the state board certainly is advocating for that. 
uh, to, to implement a, another year delay in that performance grade, ADL performance grade. And, um, and there is a movement to transform textbooks to 100% digital learning by 2017. Whether we'll get there or not remains to be seen, but that's part of the plans to transition from textbooks, hard copies to digital learning. And one that you might be appreciative of is to amend and allow school, local school districts the option of a balanced calendar of no more than 25 days. So the calendar, school calendar flexibility was also part of the state board's legislative agenda as well. So uh, I know Dr. Joe appreciated that. But anyway, uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report, my abbreviated report. Yeah. <laughs> you mean? A few less final things. I, I got a whole lot more. Sorry, I mentioned it. I just wanted to know I was not asleep at the meeting. So okay. <laughs> Sound like you were busy. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Sheriff, very much. Um, Dr. Fisher, I believe you're going to give us a instructional update at this time. Yes, sir, Mr. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity, and it's my goal to bring some instructional update to every board meeting. Uh, I think that's at the core of what we do every day uh, with, with instruction of our students and student learning. A couple things, and before I start, I, I would like to, to, to say Cleveland County Schools is very fortunate to have Ms. Miller and Mr. Hooker in their positions to bring back information, to take information. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll call sometimes and say, have you heard this? And I'll say, well, here's, here's what I'm, I'm hearing and, and take this. So we do appreciate your work, time, and energy to do that and what you represent Cleveland County Schools uh, across the state. Uh, just real quickly, a few instructional updates. Uh, some of these you've heard me talk about over the last couple months. I want to update you on where we're at in the summer. Um, Reach to Achieve has been a, a topic of, of much conversation. We've completed our four-week summer camp. It was very, very successful. I'd like to uh, say a special thank you to Donna Ketcher, uh, our elementary principals, our teachers, our parents, and community. Uh, Reach to Achieve was very successful in Cleveland County Schools. Our summer camp went well. We completed that. And so we're proud of the work of those students and teachers in schools. Uh, we've had a literacy academy that's been going on at Chain Club and Grant uh, for rising current second, rising third graders. Been an awesome opportunity. We still want to display a, a special thanks to Deborah Corey, uh, who's, who's here tonight. Uh, her Title I staff has been tremendous in working through that. Uh, and administration and teachers at Chain Club and Grant working with those students in, in summer literacy has been fantastic. Um, our math academy. Heard this many times. The math academy is phenomenal. Uh, I see Reverend Murphy uh, here tonight. Appreciate Reverend Murphy all your work at your church and sponsoring that at Mount Caffrey and, and Shiloh. Um, I was there uh, Friday uh, in both sites. I uh, saw students engaged, working hard. It's a phenomenal uh, partnership that we got with our faith based community. Uh, I'm real proud of the work that those, those students are doing there in the community math academy. That's, a community, that's an academy that grows every year. I couldn't get out of the parking lot Friday without uh, being asked about plans and growth and some, some possibilities for next year. So I'm uh, really excited about that. Uh, Ready, Set, Grow is a kindergarten program we've got for rising kindergarten students, and that's uh, ongoing and this week and continue over this week and next week at our elementary schools. So you'll continue to see some yellow buses uh, running through the, the streets of, of our communities over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've got high school students that are involved in, in activities such as Governor School, Summer Ventures, Western Bound, uh, lots of different things that our high school students are involved in uh, instructionally and continuing their knowledge. Uh, beginning in just a couple short weeks in August, we'll begin robotics camps. I know many of you have been to our robotics competitions uh, and students are excited about robotics camps beginning. And we've had teachers in for some training for robotics and we're excited about uh, what's going on there with those students. And robotics is just a, a, one of many examples I can give you of our students really excelling, doing great things, uh, changing the way that we do school, we change the way they learn, and, and really accelerating uh, some great things for, for our students. We're excited about the opportunity there. Um, we'd like to just discuss real quickly some preliminary reports. Don't have any hard data for you, any numbers, but some of our preliminary looks look like our graduation rates are, are, are going to be up. Uh, dropout numbers are, are drop, the number of dropouts are down, and our graduation rates look like they're climbing again, as you remember. Last year, our graduation rate was 83.3, the highest it's been in Cleveland County. Uh, first time we've been above the state average, and we anticipate that to continue to grow. Uh, our tech preliminary test score results also look good. Uh, again, that's not, uh, don't have any official word on that, but preliminary. We're excited about the official release of that uh, later on, uh, hopefully at the beginning of the fall, so we're excited.
side by side. The last instructional update I'd like to pass along is, is uh, Ms. Miller mentioned, is, is the passing of the Common Core Bill, which will change uh, the Common Core. As you know, the Common Core is, uh, in, in, in that name, Common Core is, is going away. Uh, it passed by the Senate and the House. Um, you know, I've been asked, what does that mean? Uh, it doesn't mean anything for instruction for us this year. Uh, uh, the standards will stay the same this year. And we do expect over this year to uh, we'll see some, some, some adjustments. I believe those adjustments will be um, uh, slight, especially at the beginning. And there's some good provisions put in that that, you know, um, curriculum changes have to be passed by the State Board of Education. And, and there's some, some, some things there that, that uh, we feel comfortable not going to just change everything that we've been doing. As you know, and I, I've been covered, you know, the state, the Clinton County Schools, it's been a lot of money training teachers and working with teachers on the common core. So we, you know, we we're, we're happy to say that we're not going to uh, you know, change up things and throw it all away this year. The common core will stay this year, and then there'll be some changes made by recommendations from the committee and then uh, presented to the state board. So obviously we'll keep you informed and updated on that. But uh, those things as far as instruction, we just want to update you. I know during the summer, sometimes people think that uh, uh, you know, school stops and not a lot, not a lot's going on. But if you've been like me and out in the community, you see, you've seen our yellow buses, and, and I, I will say, uh, you know, appreciation of David Bless and transportation. Um, I've had to call David in multiple times uh, at, during spring, and they were going to need buses for this, we're going to need buses for this. And I said, I'm not sure when you're going to get them uh, washed and serviced, but we're going to need to run them in the summer. And, and, and Mr. Bless has been very, very flexible and make sure that our students have a bus to. to uh, to ride on, so that's uh, that's been a great team effort. Instruction, we've got a lot of instructional things going on in the summer, a lot of great things going on with the in schools uh, here in the summer months. Uh, Ms. Miller said here reminds me that that even our community partnerships with uh, uh, us were so with Ms. Miller one day, one morning in a meeting, she said, I've got to go, I got students waiting outside the art, art, uh, art, uh, in art center for art camp. So, our students are really engaged uh, in instruction like them here in the summer. So, um, you have any questions? Please let us know. Questions, Dr. Fisher. How, how many third graders have we got still on the short end of reading to you? Uh, I've not gotten a final report, but that that is a very small number. We started uh, summer camp with about half of what we anticipated. Um, you know, again, that, the hats off go to the, the teachers, and administrators, our third grade uh, teachers, teacher assistants, administrators they did a phenomenal job. And, and as uh, principals were coming in at the end of last week, and even some scanning the beginning of this week, uh, they were very very happy with the numbers we got. We'll, that begin there. Our, our school were very pleased with the work that our students and teachers and folks did that. Very, very pleased. A lot, a lot lower than we anticipated. No further questions. Just, Mr. Chair, yes. just briefly, I don't want to steal uh, some of the thunder. I understand, uh, Dr. Fisher, you will ask uh, uh, some of the, uh, the members or the team from the uh, Math Academy to come and kind of give an update or report, report yes, out. Um, which um, I, I think there would be some exciting things. And I, I guess I shouldn't steal that thing. I know that one of the visitors was from the state that uh, wanted to feature them in the National Magazine. And, uh, but uh, Ms. McClure may get upset with me, so I won't go any further. Don't tell everything you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say that uh, Thursday, Friday evening, the community math academy has their graduations. Uh, and so if you're available to those either Thursday evening or Friday evening, this is the last week, so you have not had a chance to, to visit any of those two sites, the shower or Mount Gabby. We still have an opportunity to be there. Right. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is uh, some information and explanation for getting teacher support plan. I believe Jennifer Walker is going to handle that.
TCPA004. I believe all of you have a copy of the plan and I would like to answer any questions you may have or provide any clarification needed. Board members, do you have any questions for Ms. Walker? Uh, this is an action item, so what's the pleasure of the board? There be no questions. Make a motion that we approve the beginning teacher support program. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the beginning teacher support plan as presented from, by Ms. Walker. Uh, any discussion? Mr. Chair, I have one that read it. I, I kind of got to the information a little late, and, uh, and I'm certainly very supportive of some of the professional development. Um, I was just I was kind of trying to survey uh, the information. It's kind of at the last minute, I'll be honest. I apologize, but I was looking for some areas of cultural competency kinds of uh, just issues and training. Is there any components in there that deals with that request that as part of the teacher evaluation tool certainly um, diversity is in standard two the teacher evaluation tool and so that's addressed through that but this particular program um, has very specific components and the components you see before you are the 13 specific one where state board policy has support i'm not sure that really answers your question it can it, it answer it but you know i, I think that we need to be a little bit more intentional Making sure we, you know, I, I understand these requirements, but just wanted to kind of emphasize the need to incorporate that as much as we can in the budget by profession. And like our formal presentation <coughs> or more in our induction program, is there one of those that would you like to see that ongoing through our induction program that we do over three years? I, I think it's important. That's um, hit heavily in the second year that we, um, because they focus on nothing but those five standards throughout, so it is a portion of their second year of induction series that we do. But we can make more attention on the subject. There being no other questions, what's it? And there being a motion on the floor, I believe. And then seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 You opposed? With your program. Thank you. And on to our personnel report, Dr. Fisher. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, we have attached a personnel report. Um, I've also given you an addendum or an addendum, uh, to that personnel report. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask your approval for the personnel report as well as um, to hire Dr. William Dixon to a four year contract as the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction at Cleveland County Schools. Dr. Dixon is currently the Assistant Superintendent at Colton County, South Carolina, Colton County Schools. Uh, he will come to Cleveland County upon your approval to take that same position in Cleveland County. Uh, Dr. Dixon is unable to be here this evening due to the death of his family, uh, but uh, he's speaking in a short while ago. So um, you've got to attach a recommendation in this uh, addendum here for uh, the recommendation of Dr. Dixon. Any questions for uh, Dr. Fisher?
in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes. Thank you. And on to the next item, the Title I application, Ms. Corey.
heard the motion has been seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Are you opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Mr. Lee, I believe you're up next with the budget update, followed by the surplus declaration. You heard that everything's been solved, right? <laughs> you nailed the uh, packet in This will be a Really old school PowerPoint. Put the pages instead of the little clicker we go through this. Uh, kind of, yeah, uh, overview of where we are and how we got here. Uh, basically, the, the governor released his budget early in the year, and that budget carries no weight other than really setting the, the uh, philosophically what his approach to education and funding. His programs are going to be, and ever how he may be able to influence the House and the Senate as they go forward. You know, so uh, the governor always presents the budget, but ultimately the House and the Senate will be the ones that adopt the final official budget. So we had the governor list his education budget. Uh, K-12 uh, budget was eight point oh nine two million a billion dollars in that budget. He funded or requested an average teacher salary increase of 3.3%. Uh, there was a reduction in teacher assistance, but it was only the reduction for what would have been AEM growth. So, in, in other words, uh, they wouldn't have funded TAs for the growth in AEM. He would have still funded uh, K3 uh, teacher assistance across the board. There was a, and, and these are not all of the items in his budget, but these are the highlights of the items that really impacted uh, public education. Uh, the transportation budget was projected uh, under his under the governor's budget to be reduced by $5.5 million. The governor also uh, included in his budget passing workers' comp compensation insurance back to the local LEA for the state paid employees. Uh, that would have been a hit to the local budget across the state of nine million dollars and of course our 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 person had whatever uh, the workers comp claims for state paid employees including the county the uh, <clears throat> governor's budget also restored the salary supplements for education a master's degree uh, doctoral degrees and those sorts of things we just click and click the page to the next next after budget the Senate is supposed to adopt their budget. Their budget is $8.112 billion. Originally, it, it funded an average teacher salary increase of 11%. The salary is capped out at $50,000 after the 20th year. In other words, it didn't increase beyond $50,000. Uh, teachers originally under that uh, proposal had to voluntarily relinquish longevity that was built into the salary scale. They had to voluntarily relinquish career status and tenure. And the teacher had to voluntarily agree to the graduate pay grade, which was no uh, uh, master's level pay, no doctorate level pay, even into the professional uh, teacher category. They eliminated teacher assistance from grades two, three, the state cut was $233 million. Cleveland County Schools, a portion of that cut was $2.174 million if that proposal were adopted. Teacher reductions were $43 million. Those were the teachers that whenever the buying budget was adopted in 2013-14, they were supposed to be uh, allotted to the school systems in 2014-15 in the second year of buying. Uh, so you never receive those positions. You can call it a or whatever. But it was teaching positions that we would have received under the budget we adopted last year. And that may be coming to play uh, as we go further based on some of the uh, comments that Sheila has already uh, shared. The year. Under the Senate's budget, uh, we're cutting transportation $28 million, a significant cut to, to our transportation program. Now, that will be statewide. Uh, educational salary supplements were restored, but they were only restored if you remained on the 
for a pay scale that would be equal to the, uh, what they classify as professional teacher status. The House education budget was $8.061 billion. Again, the highlights average teacher salary, 5%. Teacher reduction the same forty-three million dollars. That's those are those again those positions that were built to reduce class size last year to be phased in for the 2015-15 school year. Uh, education salary supplements were restored restored across the board and those were built into the scale. So that was a continuation of the salary scale as we wanted it to be uh, for a number of years. Teacher assistant funding was left intact for K3 across the board. In other words, there were no cuts. Senate was the first to adopt the budget. Uh, the House was the second to adopt the budget. Those budgets went to each chamber. Of course, they, they uniformly rejected those budgets and nominated conferees. The Senate and House both appointed conferees. There have been numerous proposals presented. To, to each of the other chambers over the last several weeks. You read all of the uh, he said, she said, everybody else said, whatever it is. It's gone back and forth between the, uh, the House and Senate. Uh, but ultimately, to this point, we're still at stalemate. Uh, there's been a number of proposals, but nothing has, has passed at this point right now. Um, to put, to put the page. Here is the latest proposals that are before the Senate and, and House. So you do see a, a moving together, uh, finally, of some of the proposals, but there's still a lot of ground to be covered. The latest Senate proposal reduces the salary increase from the 11% that was built in to, to an average of 8%. It establishes a 6% step pay scale. That's important that there are only six steps built into the pay scale that covers a third year career if you want to be a teacher. Uh, there's, there's four years and then the next four steps are three year increments and then the final 16 through 30 is, is one, one pay scale. One pay scale on step, $50,000. It eliminates teacher assistance for grade three at this point right now. So they backed away from eliminating teacher assistance in grades two and three to eliminate, to eliminate teacher assistance in grade three. The catch to that is it makes teacher assistant funding for grade two a non-recurring item, meaning that if the Senate or the General Assembly next year did not Reestablish teacher assistance for grade two. They can go away after this year. So they really have a back very far from where they were to begin with. And again, the eliminates T expansion for grade two. If you look over on the House side, the House started out at a 5% average increase. They have, in, they have raised their proposal to try to, to get the uh, Senate to come on board to an average of 6%. It uses basically the pay scale that's in place. It builds a 6% uh, salary increase into the existing pay scale. So you have 30 steps. You have 30 plus steps. Uh, it funds teacher assistance for K3. It eliminates the TA expansion. That's the compromise that they pass back to the, uh, to the Senate. So they, they've come to the point that said, we won't fund TAs for those additional ADM growth that you've got for the support to us to have TAs still in the budget, K3. This page one more time, please. The latest Senate proposal leaves an unspecified K-12 education budget cut of $173.881 million. That means that somewhere or another, the cut has to be done, whether or not that is, is a, a back to the old discretionary reduction that there was in the past year. I don't know what that really means, but there's $173 million 
million dollar cut in the central proposal, it still has to occur. Either they will identify that or we will identify it. And most of the language that's occurred coming out of the General Assembly is the one that we have to occur from the additional cuts. Uh, lottery, they agreed to, to raise the, the amount of money that they would take from lottery to fund part of this budget to $116 million. And they, they dropped the time teacher salary to relinquishing tenure. Latest house proposal on a kind of an item by item uh, perspective leaves an unspecified K 12 education cut of $136 million statewide. Uh, again, they, they agree with the Senate, but on the uh, additional lottery proceeds to, to be funded, in, funded into education, uh, into the regular education budget. $116 million. Uh, they moved the teacher pay package that they originally had from 5 to 6 percent, and they've accepted the Senate's lottery. If you could the page one more time. Where do we go from here? The conferees uh, are, are still meeting. The Senate is supposed to meet at 5 30 this, this afternoon, and the, the House is supposed to meet at, I think, 9 30 in, in the morning. <coughs> They could adopt a, uh, a compromise budget. Uh, I don't know. Uh, as Ms. Miller has already stated, uh, there has been talk that you really have a budget. Uh, the second year of the binding budget was adopted last year, and if they adjourn and don't come to compromise in some form or fashion, that budget that was adopted last year for the second year will automatically go into Play, and that would be our budget, and would be, uh, as she's already pointed out, no salary increases. Uh, but then there would also be a lot of other things that uh, uh, I think most of us consider to be good possible. There would be no TA cuts and those sorts of things that, that come into play. There. So the conferees could adopt the budget. If they do adopt the budget, then it would have to go back to each house. The house would have to adopt, would adopt that concrete budget. The Senate would have to adopt that concrete budget, and then both houses would have to, to agree to that. Uh, if they do not do that, uh, in fact, the General Assembly could adjourn under the uh, Representative Moore's proposal last week to put a to pass a bill to end this session this Friday. That's kind of where we stand right now. I'd be more than happy to try to entertain these questions that you may have. But again, there's just been a lot of speculation and very little uh, hard fact that we could really tie anything to. I'd be more happy to try to respond to any questions that you may have. More news? Yes, sir. Dr. Lee, um, thank you for your report. I had a quick, just, just looking back at that biennium budget is adopted. We are looking at keeping all our TAs, um, same, same everything, no potential cuts that you foresee. I know that you said that. That's pretty much what we're looking at, the biennium budget. The biennium budget really uh, leaves the program as it was in place in this past year. So there's some minor changes to it, but there's very little there. Uh, and the budget really does remain. No salary increases. Uh, operationally, we'd be much almost identical. The 14, 15 year as we were. And Representative Moore said that it could be a possibility as of this Friday. That was his. That was his bill. He introduced was to adjourn to the session uh, July 25th.
One part controls the house, another part controls the city. And philosophically, you know, they, they said, we can't knock them out. Because these guys won't come yeah. aboard. The other said, we can't knock them out because these guys won't come aboard. Well, it's the same party, but they still can't. They, they, they can't come, come to, uh, to grips with that. And in the 30 years I've been doing this, I have never seen it come to a point and, and, and actually adjourn a session and just say, well, the budget, what we did, I've been really 12 months ago. Well, stop. And I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought this last budget was had a short fall in it anyhow, didn't it? Weren't they behind on the budget anyhow? There, yeah, there, there, there's been uh, speculation about you know, the, the Medicaid issue, and that's kind of the real issue that, that's going to come into play if, if they do that. There, there are a number of uh, folks that uh, will, will, will not necessarily receive the uh, uh, on helping the human services side and receive the, the benefits I, I think that are probably needed and that both houses really think that, that it's important because it's not built into the uh, uh, into that budget that, that, uh, if the Senate and the House were to get together, does the government want to have to then sign? He does have to, to, to sign the, the bill, but the fact that uh, it's a GOP governor and, and House and Senate, uh, I, I know there's been a lot of talking going back and forth. I can't imagine he would have signed the bill. He has come out very publicly, very vocally, in, in favor of getting some of near where the House budget is as opposed to the to the Senate budget, and I know that uh, he and Mr. Berger have had some, some pretty sharp uh, comments uh, uh, about each, of each other and, uh, uh, or about the, uh, the Senate versus the government and, and what have you in, in that process. But, but he's been very vocal, vocally supportive of uh, somewhere uh, along the lines of what the House budget. How many teacher assistants would we lose if they drop the the, the uh, second grade or the third grade? I don't know the exact number of school, but uh, basically the, the funding drops in half, so we're going to lose half the people we have. Half of our half of all our kids. Yeah, if they drop the second and third, if they drop the third, then this may not be. Exactly, which is about four of those things. So we can lose that since a lot of the TAs or bus drivers are going to lose a lot of bus drivers. That's going to be the difficulty for us, yes, sir. It really is. Those that, people are uh, critical to our operation. And, and not just because of our bus, but because of other things that they, that they do in the classroom. But, but it will make it awful for us, for our buses. And the, and the fact that not, that's not to diminish anything they do in the classroom, because I've been there, I've seen what they do. Those TAs make our elementary schools work, and without them, it's going to be very difficult to do the kind of work that we've been doing in our elementary schools. Um, those TAs are talented folks that work hard with our kids. They're really supporting the whole running of the school. Um, when you start talking about losing a fourth of your TAs at elementary school, talking about drastically changing the whole complexity of the, of the elementary school and what goes on there. Uh, and if you lost half of it, uh, it would be you know, catastrophic to the program offers. The, the state budget office congestions are in the Senate because it was a body in the country that we got sick to positions in the same way. Take your many of, uh, of our high school and middle school uh, teachers' assistants. 
uh, or is that local funds? That's local funds. And one more question. Uh, Ms. Miller brought up uh, and said that we haven't had a race since 2008. Now that's at 1.2%. Is nobody in our school system has had a race since then? If somebody's changed that, a, a position or something, uh, but it had, it had not had a salary increase because uh, I'm doing the job that I was doing last year and we this year, and I'm not that way. In other words, no, but no in our administration. No people's had no raises, uh, even if they're in the same position.
that crazy option that we don't want to have to put into effect. But I mean, have we even thought about that possibility? I mean, we've thought about it, but you know, it's, it, it would depend on how quickly the board wants to, to life size the, uh, uh, the process. Uh, if they cut us $2.2 million and, and you say that we can't do that, then the answer is clear. Any other questions? If not, what's the pleasure of the board?
um, sufficient. The first option would be allowing the first three days that um, if we missed three days for inclement weather to be um, forgiven based on accumulated hours. And then the next two days would be um, May 25th and March 27th. Um, option two would do four days uh, using the accumulated hours and then one of the, the next two um, if the day, you know, if we had enough, if the days occurred before March 27th, we would use that day, and then if it occurred after, we would do May 25th. And then option three would be using, um, allowing all five days to be based on, uh, forgiven based on accumulated hours. I think our preference is, is probably option B. We're well, happy to go with whatever you want, or to look at some other options if you want to. Um, I think when we looked at our accumulated hours, we could do up to seven, if I'm remembering correctly, but we felt like that. We did it to seven, we don't give ourselves any flexibility with other things happening. So we felt like going with five would be our best option. So option three is your preference? Option B, the second one. Option, option, option two. two. Option two. Two. Sorry, I don't have A, B, C in my head. Okay, all right. You've heard Ms. Monkler, any questions for oh, On option one, you've got May 25th as the first, the last one, like the second one. We got March 27th as, as the first. Uh, tell, me, tell me what you're just thinking was. Why, 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 why May 25th and one in March 27th? On the other? With, with option two, it just get, it, we put it because we would use either one of those depending when the days came. You know, if we had so much snow in February that we took, we did four accumulated and then it was before March, we could do that. Because you think if we have that many days, we may need, may, you know, if we have more, we may need, we have to come back. So that would just give us that option. We listed the May 25th um, first and the other one because in all of the last five calendars, that has been our first designated day. Has been that's Memorial Day. Has been the one that they've chosen to be a snow day. So we just kept it as it had been in the past. No really thinking other than that's just what we had done in the past. And March 27th. That's the kindergarten organization. And we view that day's always been one too. That's been one of our our choices. Ms. Wampler, um, is there a reason why? Memorial Day has been, you know, I know it's always been that way they say, but is there a reason? I think because it's at the end, and when you think of snow and you're looking at days, you're thinking of where do we have a day that, I mean, it can, you know, you know, it can snow any time that could be a make that day. Yeah. In, in addition, Mr. Thurman, sometimes, you know, like in this, in this past year's calendar, you know, you were limited on a number of days, and so that was, that was the case. And that's why we decided, if you remember, to go to increase our devotional hours in some areas to get over 1,080 devotional hours. So we've got some flexibility. So if, if, unless this past winter was was abnormal, we had lots of snow. But traditionally, we, we don't have that many days. So if we miss, you know, a, a couple of days, then we would not have to tap in one day off. So that would be preference. Uh, but that's one of the kind of different options. Mr. Harris, you know, if option one is the board's choice, then we could arrange those. The, the March 27th would make sure we did. If not, there's the project. We are we're good with that. We are recommending it. I think it just gives us a little more flexibility if things happen. If we have a lot of early release days or different things that can happen, you know, this these would be whole day windows, and that's giving us four, but it's not using quite all our seven that we could use. You know, they try to strike a balance between make up days and structural time. You know, trying to, to do that. So I think these are uh, three options that, that could work either way with uh, our Definitely work with construction time and also with this guy. Well, I'm, I'm personally for option three. Mr. Toll, I would, in our last board meeting, we talked about adding 10 minutes to school day, which I was strongly advocating for so that we could do away with makeup days. And, you know, if we needed additional hours, then I would have would rather see it at, by adding a couple extra minutes to each school day than adding to keeping makeup days. Uh, so, you know, adding, if we added two minutes a day, that would take care of uh, the extra done. So I would be an advocate of, of adding those two extra minutes and that's going to make the difference, uh, which would make, actually make the difference in, in the next year like that day. Rather than continue to keep uh, makeup days, I think makeup days are basically uh, a problem for our parents, vacation, and for our kids. Uh, 
uh, they're not very good academically because so, so many kids miss them, make up things. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, option three, and if we need the extra day, go ahead and think about it. Don't have to finish to the school count. I, I agree. A lot of parents do make plans at Memorial Day. And, and in the spirit of George Lytton, he says if the state legislature would leave us alone, we'd be out of school before Memorial Day anyway. It never would be an issue. You know, we used to graduate uh, high schools about the third week of May, and it never was an issue until the General Senate decided that you had a set calendar better than we did. But uh, uh, it is important to our parents to make plans on Memorial Day and uh, to have school out on that, that kindergarten orientation day. I need work elementary school that I know a lot of folks do when they say it's uh, it's it's an intensive day when all those little ones are coming in. And if we can dedicate that day to those children and not say we're gonna dedicate the day to the children unless it snows. And if it snows, then we're not gonna dedicate the day to the children. Um, all of these have advantages and disadvantages, but I agree with with uh, Ms. Falls, uh, my preference would be an option here as well. I would Anybody want to make a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move that uh, the uh, go with option three to so make a policy. So it's been moved and seconded that we go with option three. First five days be forgiven based on accumulated hours. Any further discussion at this point? So tell me again, if for some reason we have a major snowstorm that goes through or hurricane or whatever, and we miss more than five days. We come back. Okay, we'll just start. So we probably the same shape of the same. I think last year, even with the craziness, it was five days. Yeah. Any further questions? Or discussion? I missed the, uh, as you know, I was out of town at the work session. So uh, kind of fill me in that we decide not to add any extra minutes. We had, uh, we had 10 minutes to our average today. I was, I was Our school project at Faustin is very close. We've been finished. We've been down at number three, another 
our school project uh, for a couple weeks out, but uh, we would like to appreciate with those uh, completion things. Uh, we did have a sinkhole to develop at the bus garage. I think it's really associated with um, uh, the uh, underground fuel tanks uh, that was uh, moved above the ground a few years back. Uh, we had some sinking and some uh, setting there, so we had to actually come in, uh, pick that up, put some new dirt in, and pack that, and do some re uh, asphalting with that is behind us now. Uh, Mr. Bogey was in the process of uh, placing with PCT and Graham, just to really involve about nine classrooms at that campus. Uh, Crest High School, the fire alarm update is complete. Uh, you know we have a transformer to go out there in the school here. That the transformer has been uh, installed. It is one that serves a majority of athletic facilities there. Uh, so we did have power. However, we decided as part of this project to go in and replace the three electrical panels associated with this transformer. We replaced one. Still have a few of there. Uh, Kings Mountain High School, I shared with you the greenhouse with the part of Mr. Fogelman that has been installed. Power's in. Our uh, guys are still working on the plumbing uh, aspects of that, and then we've got to have some concrete walls there. Uh, the uh, softball best facility, the uh, shingles are on, uh, bricks up, so that, that building is in the dry, so they're doing some finish work there. Uh, also, uh, part of the Title Nine, the former field house. Now, sir, women's uh, athletics uh, painting is complete in that facility. We've replaced some lights and uh, hopefully have the lockers installed shortly. Uh, North Elementary, we did replace their gym floor with uh, the rugrise form that has been installed. King Mountain Middle School gym rod, uh, that new floor system is installed. It really looks uh, sharp. Uh, that's, been in, that's been completed a couple weeks. We've been announced some curing time for that new floor. And hopefully First week in August, we'll have the bleachers installed. Uh, Crest Middle School, uh, and then Dr. Boots is hoping that those IP phones arrive. Right. She'll start adding installation there at uh, Crest Middle School. Uh, also, you can see that we have purchased a full classroom open. Uh, this is very similar to what we did uh, in regard to the purchase of the unit that was at the community uh, college that we uh, relocated to. High school. Um, Mr. Allen, this, this year was at Shelby High School. The uh, five year lease ran out. Um, Mr. Allen really initiated this move. Uh, he did not need the space any longer. He had moved his foreign language teachers uh, to inside the building. So uh, we were able to contact our provider. They had a uh, you know, track price to purchase this unit. So we we're going to be able to relocate it to the high school. That said, it started. What that will do is allow us to, uh, we have four double wides that leases run up this year, so we will be able to uh, remove four of the double wides uh, there at so That unit will be located on the south side of the Crescent Academy. Uh, we'll have 12 there. So, uh, have good luck on that, uh, on that process from Crest High School and that HFAC meeting, so uh, we're fortunate to have this opportunity. So I can share with you, uh, when leases run up, Number of times these uh, units, it's not a track cost. So we're based on their inventory and what they have out there. So uh, we try to take advantage of that when we can get out of these units. Um, Chairman, I'd also like to take just a few minutes to, to give you an update on the uh, new uh, health park. It's not really our project, but how uh, it has a little bit of an impact on the food uh, you know, I'm back and share it with you. Yeah, this would be, uh, it's my understanding that uh, we've done some 
soil mediation for this uh, new health department. And basically, um, the, the pad that they're going to build the building is on some soil that holds moisture. So they're going to uh, have to mediate that, and I think it's a process of uh, uh, surcharge. And what they actually do is they take extra dirt, bring it in, stack it on that pad before the building will be built. And it actually compresses the soil, settles it to a, a level that will meet compaction requirements. And I say that because uh, if you remember the land behind Shelby Bill, excuse me, Shelby Intermediate, um, there's about 40 acres there that ties into this current site where they're building the new health, uh, health department. You know, where our track is located, that's not the county school park, that's the county park. So what they're going to do is they're going to go below our track, below our athletic fields, and that's where they're going to reclaim the dirt to use for the surcharge. So you'll see the construction below uh, Shelby Intermediate, below the track. It's currently a sustainable landscape, and we didn't do it. don't even cut that anymore. But they're going to actually uh, move tons of dirt from that area to where they'll build the uh, health department. And I don't know if it's a month or two months, but that surcharge that place is in I say that so when you see <coughs> grading down behind Shelf Intermediate, that's, that's what that was. I've never heard of that, but uh, that's much. So they'll be left there right back down. If you see that, that's, that's the point. And it is a, it is a, a technique that's used in you know, preparing sites that have action issues. So, did I understand you correctly? When school starts this year, parents will not enter. Shelby Intermediate, the way they did last year. Did I understand you correctly? That's correct. Well, no, no, no. Buses. Buses. The main entrance at Shelby Intermediate will be at Florida. Okay. So that isn't changing. That's not changing. Okay. And so basically, our buses enter that uh, just for convenience of dropping students off the grounds. Okay. And then we have staff walking there. So basically, if they're hanging up, they're hanging up bus ramp. And staff. As far as our student drop off, pick up that moment. Or this time, the soil mediation that you speak of, that'll be done before school starts. Well, will we have to build, I mean, the kids are going to be using the track and things like that. Will we have to do a fence or anything? Yeah, we'll put that construction Okay. And again, I'm going, you know, it's not close. It's, it's down. If you've ever seen that area, so it's going to fall off there. It's way off from where they're going to be doing it. Yeah, it's going to this. When you say below, I didn't know it was yeah. going to be there. And that is, they will have that. Uh, and uh, I think the my understanding is that the actual moving of dirt has been done before school starts and then bring it back. Um, and I think that's based on you know, just the time frame. Okay. I have a quick question, yes, sir. Uh, mentioned it several times. Each PAC knows on the projected projects. There's only four of those now. We used to have a lot more of the schools as a project for that. Yes. And how have we? Mm -hmm. That's just that, that's been a that's just an error on uh, leaving some off. But we have not taken any off. Burns, so, Burns Middle, Crest High, Crest Middle, Burns Middle, Crest High, Crest High, and then we have uh, a few other members too. So that's just yeah. Okay. Well, that's just got two types of schools. I guess, I guess my other question is, do we have any plan? I mean, that's been on there for several years. What's our game plan in getting some air conditioning for these? I mean, I, I, I went to an event several months ago at Crest Middle School. It was very uncomfortable in there in the gym. I mean, what's our game plan to make this happen? Uh, we've been basically just dealing with our, with our funding and as far as our projects. But the one thing, and, and I'll, I'll share this, is that once we start this process, that it will, it will uh, and we've looked at it at Barnes High School. We, we, we've had an engineer come in, and to, in order to cool their gym and their locker rooms in that area, we will have to have power to cool. And that's the thing that, that in most of our schools, because of the age, the limited amount of extra power that's in those facilities, we're looking at uh, substantial cost.
see some kind of plan on how we can start making some of these happen. I know we can't do them all in one time, I understand that. But I think we, we owe it to our students and our teachers that we can use these facilities, especially during the summertime. We can, we can get some kids off the street from using some of these facilities for some good tables when you have a cool place to play basketball or, or do something than it is to go into places. 95 degrees and the doors are open and the fans are blowing a lot of air. So, you know, but they start school in August when we feel pretty warm then too. So, but I'd just like to see some kind of plan that we can start rolling a little bit more on trying to get some uh, air conditioning in some of these students. It's my thoughts. Are you saying with the power and you got a figure? I know it's actually 175,000, it's going to be much more than that. Any guess right now? I was thinking that I think that we have created the power at Barnes Hospital for their well and land. That was, I think that was a project you approved so that it was in excess of 100,000 dollars So you were in In excess of 100? Yes. And they were? Mm -hmm. These children, you know, so instead of 175, we might be facing 275. Right? And every per gym, I'm talking and, about. And, and every site's a little bit different. One we looked at was at Burns Hospital. They do not have the power in that structure. That's the other one. Well, are you saying that maybe Crest has enough? No, I would think those two, their sister schools, would be very similar. I mean, we've added power to the security that area there. Uh, Crest High and Jerome Burns High. And we, uh, so we brought this up at the time that we uh, added the power for the welding, Burns High, and, and the engineers that we had. That would not be the best and most economical way to have power in that area and then run through the building. Uh, on, on your plans for your auditorium and adding those classrooms on that side, if that would be an extra time to put the power in that gym because it's right, uh, it's right inside the door. But uh, what is our plan down the road? Uh, are we looking more into this? This auditorium and these classrooms for these two high school burn and crash. Yeah, we've had uh, back of our previous work session, we had those big numbers. Right. right. And that's, that's all we've done. Who do we need to be talking to? I'll be honest. I have to do it. Well, do we need to be hollering at Rob? We holler at him. We need to holler at him. If we we can, we will. I don't have a problem. You know, from the hot seat, I mean, you get getting all these questions. Oh, I, was just, fine. That's fine. I was looking on there, and there was one more. Um, but the Crest High School side of Ruben's utility building, the fence, and then it says football field. Does that include the press box? No, well, uh, that is a, a project that Mr. Uh, Bogey was really partnered with the. Uh, Portion well, the, uh, the touchdown club there, uh, portion thing. And how much do Last year, we, <laughs> they have uh, only for years to be able to uh, bear hot dogs, hamburgers, fries, and home athletic things. And to meet uh, the uh, health inspection requirements, there's some, some change we need to and so Steve has worked with that group and we've partnered together to have uh, you know, force of concrete, have a covered area, uh, run, some, run some power, do some things to uh, help make that happen. That's just basically, uh, I guess, updating and their uh, outdoor concession stand there that was, that you face this first day there on the left. Those two press boxes at both schools is in terrible shape. Bathroom doesn't. And uh, they definitely need to have some attention. But let's don't forget about North Shelby School uh, on top of that. Uh, uh, these touchdown groups, I don't have a problem with them. But if we've got to go to forking out a bunch, and that's taken away from that air condition too. If we agree to help out on something there, 
aspect of what something else that we we got plans on want to do too. Because just like over at Kings Mountain, uh, the gentlemen spent a lot of money at, the, at that group over there. They spent a lot. But how much did Cleveland County have to come in and stand behind them to make that happen? Uh, well, if you spend it there, then we can spend it uh, at the uh, on these air conditions or or that's just take it away because it takes a little bit to make a lot uh, on, uh, on these old stories. And here's my I'll share with you, and this has been our philosophy in regard to the operations that we do have people that come and, and do want to partner with us, you know, whether it's you know, the barn burns high or um, the crest high, you know, the different things where people want to come in and partner with us. So we do try to partner with our communities and, and, and uh, supporters and, and we've done that in the past I uh, feel uh, like that's a, a way to, to get community support and, and be part of it it takes two and uh, that's what we try to do so that's what the direction we be what we try to do I think we're also your middle name, man. some area, you know, 
you do a good job is almost impossible to please everybody. I agree with uh, Dr. Hamrick, and I'll say, I, as a parent of a child at Kings Mountain High School who plays football, I have a problem going to the restroom during the football game. So I think we have facilities all over the county that need to be updated. <laughs> You saw that. <laughs> That's right. Don't drink anything Our last item on the agenda before we get too far student transfer request. Dr. Fisher, you want to say anything about those? We've all looked at those. Thank uh, Anybody have any questions for Dr. Fisher on student transfers? Do we have any hearings coming up? Dr. Fisher, we're here to communicate every once in a while. Any of these related to athletics at the high school? Not to my knowledge. Thank you. I make a motion we approve the transfer uh, request as recommend, uh, recommended by the superintendent. I second. We've moved and seconded that we uh, approve the transfer request as recommended by the superintendent, Dr. Fisher. Uh, any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. That completes our agenda. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Second. 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 Please go complete.